Justice and the Secretary of State for the Home Department and another part heard and the Queen on the application of FB Afghanistan and the Secretary of State for the Home Department part heard. Yes, well, uh, Ms Kilroy, we, we, we read all of the gobbets and uh, we, we, we don't understand the proposition to be that they establish in different words uh, over 300 years to be to be in dispute. Well, the only reason that I asked your Lordship to look at them is because there are passages of the Upper Tribunal judgment and also the judgment in um, the High Court which suggests that, there are, that, that the right, uh, it's not clear what the right means um, and that it can be, uh, it doesn't mean that you have access to court at all times and that there are, um, are no restrictions on it. And I say that those conclusions are wrong. It's very clear what the right means. It does mean access to court at all times without restrictions unless the statute authorizes it. No, I, think, I think that's so. But the, 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 um, uh, it derives from the, the tribunal's judgment, I think. Yes. And that is this concept, uh, as, it's some, as, it, as it's been put in some of the documents we've got, of this um, diminishing right to access to justice. And um, I, I'm not quite sure they said that, and I'm certainly not sure that they meant that the right itself diminishes. Yes. Um, well, I, I understand that the, the way in which it's been characterised in the Secretary of State's skeleton argument is as the ability to access the court diminishes when you're removed, uh, but it's not the right. Um, but I mean, the, the ability to, to access the court does diminish in, in practice, but um, it, it's still possible to make an application to the court if it's very urgent, very urgently, on the telephone. Yes, that's right. And so that is why it cannot, to the extent that it was suggested that the right has been impaired in any way or is reduced in any way as a result of the power to remove, that is wrong um, as a matter of law. And that's the uh, appellant's case on that. Um, but the, the, the connection that between that passage and what is occurring here is that there are decisions which the, uh, and both the tribunal and the High Court knew, although there's some confusion about the extent to which the High Court knew for reasons that I mentioned yesterday, decisions which are served close to removal, so close that it's impossible to access the court. Um, and it appears that the both courts considered that that was an inherent aspect of the power to remove. It was, it was lawful because it was inherent in the power to remove. And well, you're, going, you're going to show us some of the, uh, the examples, I think, was where you yes, were going next. that's where I was going to go next. So um, can I, before I turn to that, just uh, go to the passages in my skeleton argument? Yes. Uh, it's at CB tab 2, which summarises our appeal, because uh, I just want to be sure that, despite the discussion that we had yesterday about possible examples of what the policy might look like in other situations, that um, I'm clear about what the appellant is doing in challenging this So policy. this is paragraph six. Paragraph six to eight. Yes. And that is the core of the appeal here, which is, and, and my Lord asked me yesterday, what is the significance of the notice period? Is that even part of the appeal? And of course it is, because it's the consequence of the shortness of the notice period that decisions are pushed into the window. And in the end, that is the, has always been the core of the appellant's appeal here. Yes. And that is why, indeed, the removal directions themselves are as significant as they are, because so many decisions have been taken in the window which impact on the lawfulness of the removal and it's therefore necessary to know when you're going to be removed in order to challenge them. So that's the connection that is drawn there. So it's paragraph six to eight. Uh, the same point is made at paragraphs 29 to 30. Yes. And at paragraph 49, five. And it's throughout the skeleton argument that I've just highlighted those key passages. So 29 to 30 and 49 to 5, which is in the submissions on access to justice. Yes. So we've seen in summary under the policy yesterday um, that uh, these are the core parts of the policy. If you make a first asylum claim, 
the window should be cancelled. If you make a human rights claim which is certified, you should get a further five days notice. Now that's the policy that's been inconsistently applied and you see that recorded in the judgment of the judge below. Yes. If you make a fresh claim which is not accepted as a fresh claim by the Secretary of State, you can be removed without further notice thereafter. If you seek a deferral of the window or of the notice period, which is rejected, you can be removed shortly thereafter. And of course, you're not told about the removal directions. Now, my lords, Miss Navarretti's statement is at tab 19. I don't know whether your lord, my, my lords have had a chance to read that statement. So tab, tab 19 or? Tab 19 of, uh, of the supplementary bundle one. Yeah. Again, give, it, give, give, it, give us by all means the um, particular passages you want us to look at. It's probably unnecessary to read, read them out. Mm, yes. So this so is supplementary one. Supplementary bundle one. Tab 19. Yes. At paragraphs 9 to 10, um, she sets out her expertise, which I won't go through. And paragraph 16 is an important part of her statement, which again, I'm not going to ask you to read now, but it's, um, if you could just look at the headings under the headings there, paragraph 16. This is the scope of the policy the numbers of people to whom it applies and in, in the circumstances in which the windows okay. can So be this served. is all the different categories? This is all the different categories. And I just want to highlight that, that when we were talking about what happens when people are being put on planes yesterday, the focus there is very much on number 10 in terms of fresh representations, appeals rights exhausted. Yes. But that is only one category yes. of the circumstances in which this is applied. And the broad <laughs> point is that... Uh, um, although uh, many will have had uh, opportunities to go around the system for some time, there are many who won't. Yes, that is precisely my yes. point. Um, uh, my, my Lord, I, I, I would like to, without going to it, draw your attention to a note um, that was prepared for the court below at 117A of this bundle. Page. It's it's tab. It, it comes at the back of tab seven. Yes. And this is a note on the Immigration Act, and it's really just to inform the court about the position as it was prior to the Immigration Act in terms of service of notices of liability to removal, and the position after the Immigration Act so as to locate the service of the notice period within that trajectory and that timeline as far as the statutes are concerned. And this is significant because as I, as, as the skeleton says in, in a number of places, but also as I said yesterday, what's, and in fact it's what Miss Dolby says, is the significance of this new process is that the notice period is moved forward to a much earlier stage. Now, my lords, the, there are various points that are made throughout what is a, a long, detailed statement, and what they effectively add up to, and they're under se several headings. This is back in, in Ms. Navarrete. Ms. Navarrete's statement, yeah. yes, I heard it. She gives her experience of representing clients with a removal window and how it works in practice, both where she is already representing those individuals and also um, where she encounters them for the first time through the duty, the detained duty advice surgeries. And you'll see um, at paragraph 30 her explanation of how that works. And in summary, 
and I'm going to show you the table of proposi propositions and evidence in a moment uh, as a substitute for going through this evidence in detail. In summary, they, her, the experience of herself and solicitors at her firm is that it is rare for them to encounter somebody who has been served with one of these notices within the notice period. And that matches with the evidence about the amount of time it takes to get an appointment on the duty advice scheme. So most of the people that she describes representing have come to her once they're already in the window. She talks about Dublin 3, a lot of the, the clients that she describes are Dublin 3 cases. So in other words, they have not had a previous asylum process. And she then also describes how the, the appointments in the detained duty advice scheme are 30 minutes long. There are 10 in one day. And so on a first encounter with a client, it is very difficult to prepare everything, impossible to prepare everything that is needed in order to lodge a judicial review, for example. And what is then required is follow-up work. And so what I would ask your lordships to do is to read that statement in its entirety because what it shows is that it is quite impossible to complete the functions for which this notice period was designed within 72 hours or five working days. Both because of the time it takes to get an appointment and then because of the multitude of tasks that need to be completed. And it's that evidence that lies behind the claim in the appeal, but also below, that it's inevitable that decisions will be being taken and served in the window. Now she summarises, I'm going to show you a few select case studies, but she summarises the case studies in her statement at um, 215. Paragraph 215. Sorry, page 215, I should say. It's paragraph 115. After the conclusion, which is at 114, I hope that the task set out above demonstrates it's extremely difficult and in the majority of cases simply not possible to carry out all the relevant work properly and issue proceedings in court in seven calendar days, five working days or 72 hours. And of course, there is no evidence to dispute this. And she then summarises the case studies um, at 115 onwards and giving a particular, with a particular focus on removals to Italy, which are under the Dublin 3 regulation. At one two one two four onwards, and again, um, if I could ask your lordships to read those parts of the statement with um, uh, when you have an opportunity not to be appealing, but could I now turn to a few examples just to illustrate how this policy works in practice? And I should say at the outset that, as we've said in our skeleton argument as part of the appeal, these are. These examples are given as illustrative examples of inherent flaws in the policy and are not advanced as a statistical sample. They are examples of how the policy works, both when it's working as intended, but also when its terms are being breached. So could I go first to the example of PO, which is at 231 to 233. Page 231, 233. And this is a, a victim of trafficking. And you'll see the, the date at the top, 1994. She arrived in the UK, age 10 with an aunt. Inverted commas. She has an asylum process in 2004, which is unsuccessful. 
it becomes appeals rights exhausted. Her case is then reviewed in 2014, but leave to remain is refused. And she's encountered in 2017, which is 13 years after her previous appeals process. And served with a removal window notice stating she could be removed at any time after 8.45am for a period of three months. She's seen after the removal window has already opened. And a, a PAP letter is then sent four days later, on the 30th of June, raising trafficking issues. And querying why there has been a failure to investigate them, because of course the Secretary of State has an independent duty to identify trafficking indicators and to investigate them. There is acknowledgement of receipt on the 4th of July, four days after that. Uh, there is further details given on the 7th of July with a fresh claim for asylum and a request for her to be released. On the 10th of July, the Secretary of State refuses to withdraw the removal notice and refuses to release her on the basis that arrangements to remove her are ongoing. And there is then work continuing to identify somebody to draft grounds. You see that between the 11th um, and the 13th of July. Urge, urgent work carried out. On the 14th of July, the representative is on the way to court with a judicial review and is told that a letter has been received accepting that there is that there were reasonable grounds to consider she's a trafficking survivor. Now the letter then also says, please be advised, we do not withdraw notices of removal because there may be a barrier in place due to the fact that in cases where it, it is refused or not pursued, then lawful removal can be pursued. Now of course, this is a case where ultimately the decision was reversed she wasn't removed before she was on the way to court. But what she will see from the dates is that between the 23rd of July and the 14th of, 23rd of June and the 14th of July, she was at risk of removal. And under the Secretary of State's policy... The judge said that at paragraph 113. Yes. But she, when what the judge said is that access to justice was in, ultimately obtained. And he says there was access to justice. There was access and the problem, i.e. the risk of deportation, was averted. Yes, it you was averted. You do with that as a summary of the case. There's nothing wrong with it as a summary of this particular case, but the example is, is um, given as an, to highlight the period of time that this individual was at risk of removal. And if a negative decision had been reached, she could have been put on a plane straight away, even though there were grounds for her to stay in the United Kingdom. So that's the first example. The second example is a Dublin 3 case. It's at 255 to 258. Then, six months later, served with a removal notice window, but he, and there has been a certification request a month before, but it's not served on him or his representatives. <coughs> when he's detained, his, his representatives are not able to, his previous representatives are not able to continue representing him because they don't have a legal aid contract. He's seen two, three days 
or four days, three or four days after the removal window opens, by Wilson's, who send a human rights application two days later over the page at 256 to the Home Office, <coughs> requesting confirmation that procedural obligations under Dublin 3 have been complied with. And those submissions are then repeated with after there's no response. And you'll see that it then takes a further five days for the uh, uh, five days from that left letter of the fourth for the Home Office to respond. They, they assert that they've complied with the procedural rate obligations, but they don't respond to the human rights application. And the following day, they attempt to remove TH. And the only reason that he's not removed is because um, he froze when trying to, when the immigration officer came to get him. The human rights certification is received after the planned removal. That's on the top of that page, 15th of November. Judicial review proceedings are lodged. And then over the page, you'll see he's released from detention. And it then emerges that he has a brother in the UK. 30 July 2017. Now, again, an example ultimately, of course, where the removal was averted, but not because of the operation of the policy. And he was at risk of, of removal, which would have been a breach of the United Kingdom's ob obligations for a significant period of time. And there was an attempted removal. ZA, SB 274 to 279. Another Dublin 3. Which is another Dublin 3 case. Again, these are all cases where there's been no previous process. Table, the bold, in ZA, arrives in the UK and is arrested. You'll see in the, in the information above in the table that he's got a history of torture in Eritrea. Claims asylum and is detained. Now, there is a confusion, as you'll see in the dates under that, as to where the Dublin 3 request should be sent to, Portugal or Italy. Initially, it's sent to Italy. Italy rejects it, saying it's Portugal that's responsible. Just highlighting the complexity of this process, depending on the facts of individual cases. Um, a formal request is sent to Portugal under Dublin 3. Portugal accepts responsibility for ZA's asylum claim. But then the asylum claim is certified, refused and certified on safe third country grounds in respect of Italy. So, a, a serious mistake in the certification. Um, then, over the following page, that's the first time that he is attended um, to, on the 3rd of November, for the DDA surgery, but there were, he has very limited paperwork. Wilson's asked for the paperwork. They don't get it. On the 8th of November, the notice of removal window is received. Again, there is a failure to provide relevant documents before the removal window opens. Which documents are you? The certification. Yeah. Uh, the, the Wilsons don't get the removal window before the 14th of November, you can see. Wilsons were not aware of the removal window before this date, no copy was served on them by the Secretary of State. So these are failures to serve relevant documents. Um, and 
you'll have only see over the page that even though a letter for full claim is sent, challenging the removal to Portugal, in pursuance of the, they, they eventually get the certification, it seems on the 22nd of, of, of November, over the page, this, there is a challenge in the letter for full claim because the certification refers to Italy, but the Secretary of State still goes, attempts on the 25th of November to remove ZA to Portugal. And he, it's only averted because he can't. <coughs> um, and there is then, because Wilson's then, and you'll see in the dates afterwards, they manage to lodge a judicial review he is not removed uh, while that judicial review is pending. But again, the, for a significant period of time, he's at risk of removal, and a uh, removal is attempted it, with the solicitors not being aware of the date of it. Um, and it's only averted by chance. My Lord, there is a, a claim that, is, that, that, that was revealed to the appellant by the defendant's disclosure in SB1, 28 to 29. Is it title pages? It's SB1, page 28. Page. This is a, um, an example that was revealed by disclosure. Somebody encountered on, a, on an enforcement. Did you give me the reference in the judgment? Yes. number one annex 7.1. Yeah, what thank the judge you says about that is that caseworker errors in specific cases of 199 do not indicate the policy as a whole is defective. Um, and what we say about that, um, as you will have seen from the skeleton argument, is that the whole purpose of a knowledge of a decision that is going to affect an individual is that you are able to challenge errors of that type. Caseworker errors take a number of different forms. They can take the form of errors in application of the policy. They can be unlawful decisions based on whether it's Rule 353 or Certification or Dublin 3. The purpose of judicial review is to challenge decisions that are taken in error, whatever they are, whether they are within the policy or without the policy, whether they're inconsistent applications of the policy or consistent applications of the policy. <coughs> Judicial review is there to protect the individual against unlawful action by the state. And in my respectful submission, it is not an answer to say, oh, well, it was just an error, if it leads to somebody being removed unlawfully. And if there was a, a method of protecting against it by allowing the person to challenge it in court. So this speaks back to the point that, that your submission, that at the very least, there should be uh, some notice of when the removal is planned. Yes, and so that it is possible for a challenge to be brought if erroneously in breach of policy, or for whatever other erroneous reason, the defendant is intending to proceed with that removal. And at the moment, the problem with the policy is that it says on its face, this is, this is when it's 
supposed to be applied, for example, your first asylum claims. It says that removal will be deferred, and that gives rise to a false sense of security often, that removal will not be deferred, because that's what the policy says. But in fact, individuals are. Well, there are a number of strands there. You, you say that there has to be removal directions to stop these problems happening. I, I'm not sure that that in itself would stop these problems. But you, your real submission, isn't it, is, is that the, there must be some opportunity to, to challenge a material decision. I use material decision because these decisions can take all sorts of forms. I mean, it may be a decision not to defer or there are lots of decisions, different types of decisions um, in these examples. But they must have an op some, some opportunity to challenge a material decision. Yes. And, and you say this policy denies them that. That's yes. why it's unlawful. That is, why, that is what I, I mean, say. I, 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 you, you don't have to say, although you do say, that the only thing that would make it lawful are removal directions being notified. I'm not sure that's right because... The, the notification of removal direction does not stop these sorts of things happening before the plane goes, the plane sets off. Well, my lord, can I answer those two, if I may answer that in two parts myself. I don't want to be seen to be give, making a, a, a fetish out of notice of removal directions per se. Your, your lordship is right that what I'm targeting is a material decision. When uh, the, the, the function of notice of removal directions is that it indicates that a material decision to remove has been taken. And if something happens in between or at some stage before that uh, removal is effected, the which affects the removal, uh, the lawfulness of the, that removal, the individual is then has an, a proper opportunity to challenge it in court. And that is... The only reason why I say you need notice of removal directions, but it's it's really your your lordship is right that what I mean is notice of a material decision in time to be able to access the court, and that is why coming to the second part of that, would it make a difference if you knew in situations of caseworker error like this about the removal directions? In my respectful submission, the evidence is that it would, because. Solicitors will know that a removal is happening the next day, even though they have, on the behalf of the individual, made an asylum claim, or the individual will know that. They will know it hasn't been cancelled because they have the removal directions. They can say, have you cancelled it? And if they haven't, you can get into court. I mean, it is a, an essential safeguard against errors of all types to know that something is about to proceed which is going to affect your rights one way or another. And so in this example, without wanting to spend too much time going through it, an asylum claim a, a removal was planned. You'll see in, those, in that list of dates, it failed. There was then an asylum claim made. The solicitors sought temporary admission and repeated the wish to claim asylum but the individual was then removed without him or his solicitors knowing that he was going to be removed there was then an, a, a, a failure to there was in fact a judicial review brought to challenge that removal but the Home Office informed the court, and you can see this on the 16th of, of October, that the applicant had not in fact claimed asylum. And as a result, the judge, accepting the submission that was made, considered it was unarguable that the applicant's removal was unlawful because stating that he wished to claim asylum is different from actually claiming asylum. Now, as we all know, that's not the approach that the Home Office normally takes uh, and a claim for asylum is a claim for asylum but in any event um, this is an, it used as an example of an unlawful removal because in fact it was recorded as a claim for asylum.
My Lord, the other examples that I I'm want sorry, to be... Just, just, just yes. I, I, I'm, I'm looking at page 28. Yes. Oh, I, I've got it. I, I just wondered when the removal window opened and it's there. I'm sorry. No, no, no point. Um, the other examples I wanted to show you briefly, draw to your attention without going through them in too much detail, is um, are those exhibited and described in the statement of Mr. Singh, which is at SB 141 to 168. This is volume one, 141 to 168. It's tab, tab 18, apologies, I should have some more of a helpful indicator of where it is. And at paragraph 21 to 20 to 46, he describes the case of AT, which went was a judicial review that was brought after this individual's removal. Now this is an example of a removal during the window after a fresh after fresh representations showing a change of circumstances. There were real difficulties in this case getting legal advice because of the it was an Article 8 case and legal funding is not available unless through the exceptional case funding scheme, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Now, the reason I wanted to highlight this, this is somebody who was removed and then had to be brought back, and the judgment on that is at tab 66 of the authorities bundle. Is this was not a challenge to the window, it was a challenge to the removal. It's the removal that is unlawful. Um, there's a successful challenge to the fresh claim and to the removal and the order is at 170 to 171. And you can see at paragraphs 2 and 3, the successful challenges to the particular decisions, the remedies that were granted. The decision to refuse to recognise the representations as a fresh claim is quashed. And there is a declaration that the removal is unlawful. Now, those are the targets of the decision. The target of the decision is not the limited notice or the removal notice window that was given earlier. And really, it's just to emphasise that these are judicially reviewable decisions that are taking place during the window. The individual must have access to court in relation to them. Um, a paragraph going back to the content to the content of the statement at forty-seven to forty-six uh, to fifty-six. <coughs> the case of MLF. Again, somebody who was removed, who had told immigration officers his life was at risk. When he was detained. I'm sorry. Sri Lanka. This is at 47. It's the case of MLF, page 152. And he had submitted further representations to the Home Office in July 2016, which postdated, including evidence which postdated the hearing of his asylum appeal. He was then on, on at paragraph 89, you'll see, served with, served with a, a window at a point where no decision had been taken on his outstanding representations. There were complications over his representation. He tried to, to lodge a judicial, judicial review on his own. And then at paragraph 51, he was detained and informed he would be removed on the same day. <coughs> and was told about the representations he, was, he had made, that they were being treated as postal application and that the Home Office didn't accept them. He would have to attend the screening unit, and he was then removed. And after a, 
um, a challenge, the Secretary of State conceded that the removal was unlawful and brought him back. And you can see the order in that claim at, at 173. Sorry, at one, yes, at 173. And again, you'll see that the decisions that are accepted to be unlawful are to refuse the protection claim and to remove the claimant from the United Kingdom. The target is not the removal notice window. So in relation to those decisions, individuals must have access to the court. Now the, the other, the last case I wanted to look at from this statement is at 1.7, you can see the story about this case, it's the case of A, described in the statement, but you can see the story from the order at 1.76 to 1.77. This is a case where a limited notice window had been served. deception was used to get the individual to attend the offices of the Home Office during the window with the, uh, well I'll ask your Lordships just to be But it's also, I rely on these examples also to give life to the submission that I made yesterday. That when a person is subject to the coercive powers of the Secretary of State, remains in the jurisdiction, things happen to that person in a window which are material to the lawfulness of how, of, of their ultimate removal or non removal. Ms. Kenny, in this case, yes. where do we find the window? That is in the statement. Um, I haven't taken you Can you just give me the reference? Sorry. Yes. So in the statement... Yes, it starts at... I, I, may I come back to you with those, those dates because I'm struggling to find them and I don't want to take up time. Is, is it A? It's A. It's the case of A at paragraph 57. He or she starts at 57, yes. It's a paragraph 57 of its stomach. And in fact, I can see that the, that the dates of the window are not clear from this statement because there is a dispute over it. It's, it's paragraph 65. The, the window itself is in the... Um, addendum bundle that was handed up yesterday uh, at 147 this is which includes the the um, material in relation to the charter flight it's the respondent's notice so in that addendum bundle we've uh, included the notice entity, I'm sure, but there the, the was a window there was a notice yes it was this one was a limited notice window so yes. it was um, <coughs> but everything that happened to him it was unlawful was in once the window had opened, and you can see that the 29th of November, which is when the interview was set for, yes. was in the window. And lastly, the table at SB Supplementary Bundle 12 to 13.
is this the referral decisions. We looked at the, some of the statistics yesterday, but these are some examples that were disclosed. And without going through them in detail, and again, my Lord, Lord Justice Coulson will, um, will know from looking at the judgment that this, what the judge said about these, is he recognised that very little time, there was very little time between the refusal of deferral and the actual removal. So in eight of the examples, there was less than 24 hours. And in none of the examples was there more than 72 hours. But what he said about them, and you can see that in the judgment, at 193, this is tab 7 of the core bundle, number is 165. 193 he says, a similar effect is information provided by the Secretary of State on 30 of 1st May indicating that 8 of 30 cases where removal followed on such a refusal would be this affected less than 12 hours. I should have said 12 hours from 24. 12 hours late. And in none of the remaining five was the delay 72 hours or more. Now that, what he says about that is that information does not show that the process of deferral is not genuine or that there was a denial of access to, ju to justice. If anything, it is likely to show these applicants did not have a case to avoid or postpone removal. Well, what the appellant says about that, and it's a theme that runs throughout this judgment, is inferences drawn about the merits or otherwise of the case, is that that is precisely the issue that ought to be addressed by a court independently, rather than by the decision of the defendant. And the problem with these deferral decisions is that there is no access to court to decide if they've been properly taken or not. Whether there were, in fact, good reasons why the individual was unable to access legal advice. Whether the Secretary of State's interpretation of events is the correct one. And the appellant doesn't put it any higher than that there is a denial of access to justice in relation to those decisions. With some of them real questions about their ability to access legal advice. Um, but what is odd about that paragraph is that four paragraphs later, at 196, as part of his conclusions, the judge says, the deferral, and if I could ask you to read that paragraph in its entirety, please. 196. 196. My respectful submission, it's impossible to reconcile that paragraph with paragraph 193. The caseworkers who took those decisions less than 12 hours before a person was going to be put on a plane did not know that they were answerable for their actions. They knew that they were not. That's the problem. And it's also, the, the, as you would have seen from paragraph 11 of our skeleton argument, these Statements the judi judicial review was available when, in fact, the whole issue is that they're not. That's what's disputed within the window. It's not available as of, as of right. Um, it runs throughout this judgment as a justification for the policy and as a safeguard. <coughs> now, my Lord, could I now turn, having looked at some examples of the evidence and how this policy works in practice, to the law, which is summarised in our skeleton argument, paragraph 48 to 49. Skeleton argument, again, is at tab 2. I say 48, but in fact, the paragraph number seems to have gone missing in my copy, at least. Tab, page 31. Summarised thereafter. 
and I also, I'm very grateful for your having read the um, passages that I asked you to look at um, yesterday. Um, perhaps, um, but may I refer you back to the judgment in this case, paragraph 212, without turning it up, there is a question, there is a, the, the, the judge cites the upper tribunal in its judgment, saying that what access to justice entails, this is a paragraph 210 of the High Court judgment, depends on the circumstances of the case, and that it was impossible to extrapolate from unison a universal proposition of what it, precisely what it entails. The judgment then, it, perhaps it is useful to correct it again, I'm sorry, we've just left it, but 212. you to look at those judgments is that in my submission that statement as I said earlier on is, is just wrong and it is very important to recognize that that is just wrong. First of all statutory limits and time limits, sorry limitation periods and time limits are, are imposed by statute or rules created under statute and furthermore they are regulated and imposed by the courts not by your opponent in a, in a piece of litigation. It's the courts who decide whether those time limits are, are as strict as they are, <coughs> and also <coughs> there are usually discretions to extend them. But the most important thing is that there are contained in statute and regulated by the courts themselves. So the comparison here is what it is inapt, and the reality and the problem with this case is the failure to, rec to recognise that the, the right of access to justice is absolute, and that is what all of those judgments say. And I asked you to look at the judgment in Anderson because in Anderson there was an argument made uh, by Simon Brown, QC as he then was, um, that there was a balance. To be struck. And that was rejected. Raymond and Honey did not permit of that argument. Um, my Lord, could the I analogy, ask... Sorry yes. to interrupt you. The analogy with limitation isn't straightforward because traditionally limitation bars the remedy doesn't bar the right yes so you, you still have a claim but you don't get damages because your claim is statute barred so you'd rely on that to say that's why it's not a a, a, a safe analogy with what we're talking about when you're talking about access to justice well, yes, I would. Right? I mean, I, I, perhaps I would. I, I do, and I'm grateful for that. But I, I, I make a more a, a different point, perhaps a more fundamental point, which is that you you put your claim in, and then the court decides what to do with it. And the problem with this whole process is that it is stopping people from putting their claims in. And I understand the point that was put to me yesterday about the difficult position that sometimes courts are placed in as a result of claims being put in. I absolutely understand that, and I don't want, on behalf of the, of the appellant, to be seen not to recognise that that occasionally does occur. But the reality is that this solution involves removing claims from the precinct of the courts altogether by, putting, by removing people before they're able to access the court. And that cannot, in my respectful submission, sit with this, these principles. Um, and, my Lord, at this point, I would like to um, highlight there is a bit of a confusion about what exactly the defendant's position is on this. Because below, uh, the defendant acknowledged um, that this policy was an impediment to 
to access to justice and restricted it, but argued that it was justified. And can I, when I say below, in the upper tribunal, the position in the High Court was a bit less clear. But could I ask you to look at the Secretary of State skeleton argument on that, which is in the core bundle of FB at 247. that is an important acceptance and concession that this is, as we have said it is from the start, a restriction on the right of access to justice. But it can't be said that it's one that's authorised by Section 10. There's simply nothing at all in Section 10 that authorises it. you'll note that concession, which was maintained at the hearing in FB, is also recorded in the judgment of FB at one, paragraph 160, which is in the core bundle in FB at page 171. Page 171. 171, paragraph 160. Yes, thank you. So, so I, 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 I understand the submission. But what, what you say is that um, this, the paragraph 61, is based on the premise that um, section 10 uh, does authorise this uh, uh, restriction, yes. and, and then proportionality comes into it. Yes. Uh, but it doesn't authorise it. So my, my prior, I have two submissions on this, and, and, and I do agree with my, my learned friend this night that it's not clear what position the Secretary of State is taking in the defence. No, feel a bit. Put that to one side. Yes. But for one, for, I have two submissions. The first is Section 10 plainly does not authorise uh, an infringement on the right of access to court. Um, and it's also, there is no evidence at all that it is necessary, that it could be implied in by necessary implication to a power to remove. Um, that uh, you should have to withhold notice of removal directions. There's no evidence at all that that is the case, and indeed. Well, e e e even if there were, you know, in uh, Witham, yes. um, or Witham, depending where you come from, <laughs> um, I mean, Lord, uh, Mr Justice Laws, as he then was, um, made the observation that implied <coughs> exclusion of a right of access to a court in a statute was a category that had no members. Yes, well, my lord, obviously I would rely on that. I know that there are some statements later on, oh, yes. particularly in the, in, the, in the line of authority in Leach and Sims and, and Daly, which suggest in the context of access to legal advisers, which I distinguish from... Yes, a slightly a, different point. Which is a slightly different point that one might have an implication. But here, yes, I, I mean, my, my, my argument is that when it's the right of a barrier to court itself, it is a court, but it is a category with no members. And well, not, we'll hear what Mr. Kovetz has to say, but I haven't understood his case as being that um, Section 10 uh, authorises the Secretary of State via a policy to exclude access to courts. I mean, I, I, hope, I hope I've got that understanding. Yes. <laughs> well, it, it, I, I refer you to paragraph, one, no, paragraph 61 that. because that does appear to suggest it does. that at that, at that time. And... Um, but what so I say is this... We'll hear what Mr. Kovacs has to say, but we may be tilting the windmills a bit here. Yes. Well, uh, in, in that case, I won't spend too much longer on that case law, because my, my submission is there is no power, plainly. It doesn't say so. This is a restriction 
the, the I mean, the, what I also refer to. But that's the issue, isn't it? Yes. The issue in this appeal is: is there a restriction? Yes. It seems to me. Well, in my well, <laughs> there is. But in my respectful submission, that the answer to that question is obviously yes, because as soon as you recognise that decisions are being taken in the window at a point where people can shortly thereafter be removed, there is no there is no reasonable area of dispute on that question. But that, but, and, that, and that's your core submission. Yes, and that's the issue, and that's your core submission. That is my core submission: material decisions taken at a point where a person can be removed, and I include in that deferral decisions because they are material as to whether you, you should be removed or not. And you have no right to that. I mean, that's why I said yesterday, and I know that it may seem that I'm taking too long over it, that it's ultimately a simple issue. But the, the reason we're here is because it doesn't seem to have been treated that way by the tribunals alone. Um, so I won't then take you I mean, to... I, I, I think, well, I, I think it is a simple issue. I think it's a narrow... I mean, I'm not saying the answer's simple. I no. think the question is simple. Um, but um, I, I'm not quite sure how much paper the tribunal below had, but we've got something like 12 rewrite files, yes. which suggests that it's not simple, but I think it is. Well, my Lord... The paper, uh, some of the paper, I can speak for myself, not all of the paper helps. Well, I'll, I'll take that on board, my Lord, um, and advise um, um, But just, just to, so on the, on the case law, even, even if there were a restriction that were permissible... Without going to it, Leach and Sims and, and Daly, and I know my Lord in particular will um, recall that um, judgment, um, that it has to be proportionate to, um, the, to the vice that is sought to be um, attacked by the statutory authorisation. There isn't a statutory authorisation, but we say one of our other points is that this policy is wholly disproportionate in its effects. That's why I took you to paragraph 16 of Ms. Navarretti's statement. And I've also highlighted some of the cases where this is, this is a very, very long way away from the sorts of examples that my Lord, Lord Justice Sickenbottom was talking about yesterday. These are not just abusive cases. This is not just the sorts of cases that, that were looked at by the Court of Appeal and SB and Satterville and Hamid and so on. This is a much wider category of case. In fact, it's used in almost all removals or was before the injunction, and that cannot possibly be justified, even if it were um, justifiable in, in other ways. Now, my Lord, I wanted to, um, in, in terms of the case law, I, I wanted to say a couple of things about um, uh, Anna Vrijeva, which is at tab 17 of the core authorities bundle. Um, but, I, but what I also wanted to, to pick up on 
It's a point that my, my learned friend did make yesterday as well. But the, 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 one of the things that has been said is that the decision on asylum here was an important decision. And of course it was an important decision, but it didn't resolve the applicant's status in that case. That was going to occur later. So the decision in Anna Frijeva on asylum did not resolve the, the, the leave to enter status. And you can see that from 614H to 615C of Lord Bingham's judgment. Give a Yes, this is, but, but he describes in mo most detail how the statutory provisions work. And the, so that's why I'm referring to this part of the judgment, because it's important to understand that, that um, it, sorry, I've got the page wrong, it's 614H. Um, and you, uh, to 615C, it's paragraph 12. And what you see there is that the decision on asylum, even if favourable, does not finally resolve the applicant's immigration status. And if it is adverse, it gives rise of itself to no ground of appeal. And that is because there is a later point, and that's why they withheld the notification. In fact, there's a later point, one of the reasons, why, where leave to enter is decided. But the point about the refusal of asylum is that that was the basis for withholding benefits. But one of the things that has been said about Anna Fujeva is that it was a much more fundamental decision, this is what was said by the uh, tribunal, than a decision, a removal of somebody from the jurisdiction. And I simply highlight that, that that is just not the case, as a matter of fact. It cannot be said that a refusal of benefits, which hinges on an asylum decision, hasn't yet, that has no impact on leave to enter at that stage. Um, is a fundamental, more fundamental than a removal. Now, without turning them up, I would also like to draw attention to two judgments which apply Anna Fujeva. We've seen Lumber already, but as establishing a general public law principle about the requirement for notice as an aspect of the rule of law. Um, the first is um, at tab 54, the Children's uh, Rights Alliance case, um, and that is at volume three of the Bible. You do want to turn that up? Um, I, I don't think it's necessary to turn it up. I do apologise. I, I'm just. It's so, I was just going to be conflicting messages there. You, yes, you I. Said, I you that said is you entirely weren't taking my fault. To us and then, we and then I think it was because I was just checking the um, that I got the name of the case right. Okay. Um, so that was me turning it up. But no, you don't need to turn it up. It's paragraph thirty-five. So it's often referred to as an acronym. It's thirty-five. And then that in Citizens UK, which is at tab 72A, again, I don't ask you to turn it up, paragraph 77, again, accepts that the principle is a, a, a requirement to notify individuals of decisions which affect their, their rights, generally. There isn't a sort of hierarchy of rights which give rise to the requirement to notify it's simply decisions which affect your rights. And in that case, that, as my Lord Justice will remember, that was satisfied because the French authorities let 
the children their, their decisions in, in that case. But the point is they needed to know about them so they could challenge them. Um, could I now look at the, very briefly, at the author, or authorities in relation to access to court in relation to fresh claim decisions? Now, my, there are three in the bundle. Onibayo, Kabake, and ZT, Kosovo. And I know that, that my lords will be very familiar with all of them. But it's important to recognise the extent to which they acknowledge the requirement on the United Kingdom to permit representations to be made right up until the last, um, until the person is removed. So on a bio is at tab 39, which is volume 2 of the bundle, uh, of the authorities bundle. made only months after a previous appeal hearing. So it's not uh, just illustrating the extent to which the court was acknowledging that even where appellate proceedings had been concluded quite recently, there was the capacity for change. Um, and at 778C, there is the recognition that asylum cases call for particular care at all stages of the administrative and appellate process. There is the acceptance at 781H of the possibility of change. 782A, if I could ask you to find that out. And then, obviously, the, 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 the key part of this decision was that you could, that a, a new claim was not a claim which gave rise to a right of appeal, uh, but that it could. Um, if it satisfied certain criteria, it would do. And that, that, that decision was a matter for the Secretary of State. Uh, but what you see at 784D to E is that neither party suggested that the asylum seeker was without redress in the situation that the Secretary of State refused to recognise it as a fresh claim. And both accepted that redress could be obtained only by resort to the court. And my Lord's that judgment is wholly inconsistent with the approach the Secretary of State is taking under this policy, which is to serve decisions under 353A in the window and then say, well, that's enough. But this, this is the same point. Yes, it is. I mean, it's exactly the, the, the point is that any decision, including uh, the refusal to accept a claim as a fresh claim, it is judicially reviewable. Yes. That's what these cases say. And you've got to have a, a, an opportunity to, to uh, access, the court. access the court on that claim. Yes, well, my Lord, I, I won't go mm. to the other authorities because they all make the same point. It's yes. Kabak and ZT Kosovo. As long, I, I mean, what I don't, what, where I'm, the reason I'm uh, slightly labouring this point is that that has not been accepted until now. It's not accepted by the Secretary of State, as I understand it. Because if it were, she would have to accept that this policy was unlawful, which is not. Can, can you just give me the references? Yes, Kabak A, tab 40. Yes, thank you. Um, ZT uh, Kosovo, tab 49, paragraphs 22 to 23. And it's all references to the court being the one who has to ask the question. That's per Lord Phillips. Paragraph 75 to 76 per Lord Brown. And also paragraphs 82 to 83. Now, my Lord, obviously this right of access to justice has been applied by this by the courts, uh, upheld by this court, in the context of medical justice, the first one. Um, uh, and that judgment is at tab 19. Volume 1. 
much as it is in the core bundle. emphasizing there are the sideline of passages of this judgment uh, but I wanted to emphasize a couple of additional points that arise out of it that relate to things that that my lords have asked me um, over the uh, all that, have, that arise particularly um, over the last um, few hours um, the first is just a, an explanation in that case of how remove the types of situ situations in which removal directions might be challenged could I draw that your attention because this I think really goes back to the point about what's a material decision and when is when are removal directions material um, and you can see that um, uh, from paragraph 50 onwards and there was an argument made there too that, that really removal directions wouldn't ordinarily be challengeable by judicial review paragraph 50 And the, the judge rejects that and then sets out a number of categories of potential claims to jud judicial review. Now, so the first one is, one is the one that we've been talking about quite a lot over the last day. Um, the second one is a reason why I say there were dangers in it in any kind of window around remo removal directions, but in any event, you can just see the sorts of situations in which there are 54, the removal directions themselves may give rise to challenges. And some of them are to do with the very extensive delays, personal circumstances may change. And then there's a reference to arguments against removal not having been put forward earlier because of bad representation. I do highlight that. Bad representation is not a, in this area, has always been recognised by the courts as not uh, being a basis for uh, refusing to allow that individual to um, proceed with their claims. So whereas in other areas of law, you're fixed with the errors of your agents, in this area, you're not because of the importance of the issues. And then there was a reference to certification decisions at paragraph 55. Paragraph 57 will not arise at the moment because the removal notice window does usually tell you the route. But I'm just highlighting those examples. Uh, and then the other part of this judgment that I would like to highlight, other than the general point which we've got, is the extent to which the judge looked at what happens on the ground, the reality of the situation, including access to legal aid, because one of the things that's been said in both judgments below is that the fact that it's difficult to get access to legal aid, the particular vagaries of the legal aid system is not relevant to the question of whether the notice period gives enough time and so on. And in my respectful submission, that's just wrong as a matter of law you need to examine the lawfulness of a policy in the real world. But you can see that, at, uh, the judge looking at all of that at paragraph 60 to 62. Of the judgment. Oh, sorry, it actually goes on further than that, 60 to 60, 65. And this is with explanations from the Royal Society, uh, evidence from the Royal Society. And generally throughout the following paragraphs, there are the, the judge relies uh, refers to the practical obstacles that are established by all sorts of parts of the system, which make it difficult for individuals to access justice. Real world. Um, obstacles, and that's at 70, 76, 79, and so on. And my Lord, um, for your note, tab, 
the Court of Appeal upheld this judgment at tab 20, paragraphs 19 to 24. You can see the reference to uh, the availability of legal assistance and, and generally the whole ratio of the Court of Appeal judgment is, a whole, it is based on the ability to access lawyers, whether time is enough in the real world to access uh, legal advice. As you see at paragraph 19, the availability of legal advice and assistance was, the judge was concerned with it only insofar as that matter had a bearing on the time that was needed. So it's, it's relevant to time. The advice has to be effective. And you'll see just again one of the inconsistencies in the stance the Secretary of State has, has taken and, uh, is that the Secretary of State actually relies on the availability of free legal advice. You see that in the middle of paragraph 20 is indicating that the notice periods are sufficient. Well, in my respectful submission, you can't have it both ways. Um, the Secretary of State, the, 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 the availability of the legal aid, of legal aid, the difficulties in accessing it, any of the obstacles that that poses, and the, therefore the ability of people to access legal advice in a very short period of time is, is relevant to the adequacy of those periods. And my Lord, I, I, finally, on authorities are the abuse authorities and one of the things I said in opening is that the policy undercuts a careful statutory scheme but also the court's own carefully modulated system for dealing with abusive claims. Now Johnson and Gorewood is at tab 42 and this is on the court's own approach could I just ask um, your lordships to look at that, which is at volume two. scrupulous examination of all the circumstances to be denied the right to bring a genuine subject to litigation before the court. And then there is a, 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 an explanation of the sort of circumstances in which the court might... Well, I, 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 I think the yes. principles in very Johnson well and Gorewood yes. and the, the resolution of a what might be described as tensions in underlying authorities are pretty familiar to us. I, so, I, I won't spend um, any time on it, but all I'm trying to, what I'm trying to highlight is that there are, some of the examples given are people bringing repetitive claims, that's the, or, or raising things that they could have raised in earlier claims, which is a Henderson and Henderson point. So these are all, none of, the, none of what we, there are particular practical problems that are raised by the immigration system, but as a matter of principle, none of the things that the Secretary of State is aggrieved about uh, and needs to, you know, wants, wishes to address are new to immigration law. People bring 
repeat claims and people have failed to raise things that they should have raised earlier. <coughs> and that's where um, the authority of J is relevant. That's tab 50. Now, my Lord, I'm, I, Lord, I'm not going to take you to it. It's incredibly long. But what it does, um, what it does do is carefully examine all the circumstances in which you know, uh, uh, the section 96 duty might or, or certification power might bite and how it should be exercised. And um, there are a few chunky passages. This is a chapter 15. Um, that I will just highlight for your note, but um, they are paragraphs 93 to 96, paragraphs 138 to 142, and paragraphs 146 to 161. But generally, the point that comes out of that judgment is the level of careful scrutiny that goes into examining whether uh, the fact that you haven't raised something earlier, which the Secretary of State says you should have done, should deprive you of the right of appeal. Well, that is a judicially reviewable question when it comes to certification. Equally, it must be a judicially reviewable question at the very least when it comes to a policy. But this is Parliament has provided for this. And there is no such provision in relation to judicial review, which is the point that the Secretary of State herself makes in her skeleton argument. And, and finally on that, tab 51 BA, where the court, where, where the uh, Supreme Court accepts that Parliament has created a complete code for dealing with the possibility of abuse. This is tab 51. Thank you. Volume 3. See the way um, that the it was all about um, how the fresh claims should be construed and, and the relationship between fresh claims and certification. Um, but what what the court did in that uh, case is recognise um, that the. See this at paragraphs um, 31 to 33. That Parliament has created a complete code under sections 94 and 96 for dealing with, with unmeritorious claims and repeat claims. in a different context in uh, talking about how the, the role of re Rule 353, the reason I highlight it is that this is Parliament's, the expression of Parliament's will when it comes to repetitive claims. It's that you certify them. You don't block them from being able to seek access to court altogether. So in conclusion on the access to justice issue. It's the appellant's submission that the Windows policy clearly undercuts and interferes with the right of that right. there is no justification for it. But the evidence shows that these are real risks 
not theoretical ones. But the, the policy on its face is plainly unlawful. And my lords, when I opened yesterday, I mentioned my agreement with the way in which my Lord, Lord Justice Hickenbottom analysed the systemic unfairness authorities. It's my submission that it's not necessary to uh, look at the number of cases and to spend um, and to establish a level of risk in circumstances where the policy on its face uh, provides for judicially reviewable decisions to be taken without access to court. But insofar as it is necessary to show that that risk arises in individual cases, the evidence is before you, and I've taken you to some of it. Now, the judge dismissed that on the basis that access that, that the some of the cases access to justice was obtained. But that, in my respectful submission, was not the right way to approach it. Uh, obviously, in cases where removal is in an issue, many of those who are removed in breach of the right will not come to light. Their cases will not come to light. And we've seen three where their cases did come to light for all sorts of accidental reasons. But that is why you look at the ones where it nearly happened and why they are relevant. It's not enough to say, well, it, it was all right. It may be in an individual case, an answer, but it's not when it comes to looking at this unfairness of the policy. But so I'm not going to take time going through the differences in the various tests in the authorities um, analysed in Wilcock. Um, uh, in my submission, whatever test you apply, this policy is unlawful for the reasons that... Um, um, so it, really for the same reasons that the, um, the exceptions were unlawful in Technical Justice 2010, really. I mean, that's, that's the same basis. The basis is that the people who fell within the exceptions didn't have the right to access to justice in the same way as you say um, everyone that falls within the policy now does not have that right. Yes, I mean, the, 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 the impact in the end of the exceptions policy and what is occurring here is very similar uh, because decisions are being served too close to removal. Uh, it is worse in some senses in the, in, in the, on, on, in, under this policy, I say because there are occasions where that, that, because that is happening when people don't even know about it, at least under the um, exceptions policy, people were informed um, in the last minute, uh, but it is very similar. And uh, in, in, in my submission, the, the approach is, uh, the, for the same reasons that that policy was unlawful, this is. And my lords, there, there are um, also two other principal grounds under Dublin 3 and Article 3. And what has been said about those grounds, both below uh, and by the Secretary of State, is that they don't add anything to the access to justice ground. And I would like to address that first, because if this court accepts that the way in which the access to justice ground was approached below um, and has been conceptualised apparently by the Secretary of State, that there was a balance, um, uh, that you don't need access to justice in relation to some decisions if you've had an earlier right, uh, then, in my respectful submission, those arguments do add substantially to the access to justice ground. If the common law is as I have presented it, and, and, and my, my understanding is that the court accepts that that is the way the common law uh, works, then those grounds um, do not add anything. But I think because that is the argument run by the Secretary of State, if I could very briefly take you to the relevant authorities by reference to the skeleton argument as well. So first of all on Dublin 3, my lord, Dublin 3 is at tab 12 of the authorities. These submissions are made on the premise that um, the Dublin 3 or Article 3. Um, Give, greater access, give a greater right to access to justice in the common law. No, they're, they're not. That's what I was trying to say, obviously not very coherently, that's what I was trying to say just now. If my submissions on the common law are accepted as to what the common law requires, then Article 3 and the, the right to an effective remedy under Dublin 3 is exactly the same. 
you must have access to a court in order to no, pass I that. The, the I suspension. That. I yes. That. So th th these come in if if we conclude that you fail on the common law. Yes, if you because uh, they don't put it in the same language. Uh, they put so on, but it's because the right to access to um, justice under Dublin 3 Article 3 is greater than the common law. Well, it's greater, my lord, it may be that I'm, I'm taking you round in circles, but what, what I mean is that, that it is greater than the common law if the common law allows a situation like this, which is that material decisions are taken at a point when individuals cannot access the court. And those material decisions relate to either Article 3 or Article 8 or um, EU law rights under the Dublin regulation. If that is what you conclude is permitted, because in my submission that is as a matter of fact what is happening under this policy, um, and you conclude, you accept the Secretary of State's argument that that is permissible, then I say Article 3 nonetheless will prevent that um, in those types of cases and also in Dublin cases and that's why Be because of the, the requirement for an effective remedy yes because of the requirement for an effective remedy and the requirement for access to a court for suspensive um, Dublin 3 has got, got a series of uh, specific protections and Dublin 3 has a series of specific protections um, and in the context of the Dublin 3 um, requirements there is also the fact that the five working days that is currently allocated for those um, for individuals to challenge their certification is woefully inadequate. Um, it is a period of time that was designed prior to the important judgments of the CJEU in Gezelbash and Mengistar, when individuals really had a tiny range of challenges that they could bring to certification. But now, the procedural rights that have been conferred on individuals as a result of Dublin 3 are significant, and they relate not just to human rights grounds, but also uh, failures to comply with time limits, time limits and so on. And what you see from the cases, and I can just give you the references, my lords, because it may be that that will be enough, and there's also argument in my skeleton argument. But what you will see from the cases is that, the extens that there are extensive rights uh, now afforded to individuals which arise at the point of certificate, notification of certification. And one of the things that was said below, and that I think it's an argument run by the Secretary of State, is that prior to certification, people, uh, the, the fact that people haven't had used uh, access lawyers, haven't sought to raise human rights grounds and so on, is relevant. Well, it isn't under Dublin 3. The point at which the challenge arises to a transfer decision is upon its notification under Article 26. And it's at that stage that you have to have your effective remedy. And five days is woefully inadequate. So, my Lord, the, uh, I'm going to give you the articles rather than take them to them because we'll see how yes. this unfolds. It's tab 12, Articles 4 and 5. Those are the articles that provide for things to be, uh, for individuals to be informed about how the regulation works when they're first encountered and Dublin 3 is being, uh, transfers are being contemplated. So those are prior to the decision. And there are extensive rights as to what information people are entitled to. Then there is Articles 26 and 27. Under the heading Procedural Safeguards. Article 26 requires the notification of the transfer decision. And the remedy then arises in relation to that notification. Now, in terms of suspensive remedy and the opportunity to ask for a suspensive remedy, my, my Lord, the, the Secretary of State relies on a case called ASA uh, as a shorthand in the upper tribunal. Uh, where um, the, uh, there was a challenge raised to the lack of automatic suspensive remedy. And that is said to be an answer, complete answer to our Dublin 3 argument. And in my respectful submission, it isn't. Because 
what we are arguing for, and Acer doesn't deal with this at all, is the opportunity to ask for the transfer to be suspended. And that opportunity must be provided in accordance with Article 27.2c. Sorry, 3c. For the purposes of appeals or reviews of transfer decisions, member states shall provide in their national law that c. The person concerned has the opportunity to request within a reasonable period of time a court or tribunal to suspend the implementation of the transfer decision. And you'll see that halfway uh, through that, member states shall ensure that an effective remedy is in place by suspending the transfer until the decision on the first suspension request is taken. So, I mean, the, the, the muscularity of this is quite striking. So you have, you have an opportunity to ask. It must be suspended until you've asked. And then any decision on whether to suspend the implementation of the transfer decision shall be taken within a reasonable time while permitting a close and rigorous scrutiny of the suspension request. A decision not to suspend the implementation of the transfer decision shall state the reasons on which it is based. So preventing an individual from accessing the court to ask for suspension is a breach of uh, 27.3c. And in my respectful submission, the evidence of Miss Navaretti in her first and second witness statements is absolutely incontest incontestable that the five working day period is nowhere near enough to satisfy um, this requirement. My Lords, the authorities on the muscularity or, or the extent rather of the uh, new procedural protections and uh, recourse under Dublin 3, tab 29. Paragraphs 41 to 56, that's Mengistan, and it establishes that you can challenge the expiry of time limits. that extends to procedural guarantees. In other words, not just the substantive rights, whether you are allocated to one country or another, but also Is even if the important point about this is that even if the other member state accepts a transfer request outside a time limit, the individual is entitled to rely on the fact that the time limit has expired as a basis for resisting their transfer. And that's the essential conclusion in those paragraphs. Um, for your note, and this uh, without turning it up, Geselbash is at volume 4, tab 83. And that is the key authority in 2016. And that's why it's important. the date is important because the, that authority post, long post-dates the, the development of this five-day working, five working day time period. And nothing has been done to adjust to this new situation. Um, 
is where the court confirmed those procedural rights that individuals had. But the other authority that is important, um, in particular in relation to the reasoning of the courts below on this, is volume is Hassan, which is at volume 4, tab 85. And that is important to, to look at. could be notified of a transfer decision before the member state um, who had been requested to accept the transfer had accepted that transfer. And what the court concluded is that that was not possible. And in paragraphs 42 onwards, you can see that question at 39. That's the issue. Notification of a transfer decision, as it, this is Article 6, notification of a transfer decision to the person concerned may take place in the meeting and therefore after the requested member state has agreed to the request. Sorry, which paragraph? 40. Paragraph 42. There is a specific 43, specific procedural order. 43, between acceptance of the request to take charge from the notification. And then at 44, the court records what the, what, what the purpose of, of, that, of Article 26 is. It's in order to ensure a more effective right at the end of that paragraph to seek a remedy against that decision. So the Article 26 request is expressly linked into that effective remedy provision at Article 27 that we were looking at. So the transfer decision and then again the conclusion of paragraph 46 may be notified only after the requested state member state has agreed to take charge of that person. And then at 53 over the page, they explain their reasoning and the conclusion is expressed first and then the reasoning comes afterwards um, about the scheme of the of Dublin 3. And more reference to the need to strengthen rights of individuals, and you'll see at the end of that paragraph 53, you ensure when you make your Article 26 notification that he is, um, um, in the case where the transfer is in principle accepted between the member states involved in the procedure to take back or take charge, fully informed of all the reasons underpinning that decision. And this is why some of the examples I showed you where individuals are just not given the underlying documents are so important, because often they are deprived of the bases on which they can actually challenge the decision properly, so as to enable him, if appropriate, to challenge that decision uh, before the court of jurisdiction. And uh, then at paragraph um, 57, the, um, the confirmation that judicial protection enjoyed by applicants for international protection should not be sacrificed to the requirement of expedition. So speed is not a good reason for sacrificing um, these protections. So that's Hassan. In my respectful submission, there are as a result of that, a number of reasons why the process in relation to Dublin 3 case does not satisfy uh, Article 27. Three. First of all, the time period is too short. That's the five days. That's the five days. Okay. 
Secondly, once they're in the window, they are at risk of removal at any time before they have had a chance to ask the court for their transfer to be suspended. And that's, again, the breach of 27.3. They must have that opportunity. Now, as a result of the... So that flows from the five days, because five days isn't enough. Five, it flows from the five days, because five days isn't enough. Um, now, there was a clarification, as your leadership would have seen, in relation to if people manage to raise human rights claims against their removal, um, that will give rise to a new window, or should give rise to a new window. There are two problems with that. First of all, often, as we've seen, because the five days are so short, people are unable to raise that until they're already at risk of removal. Um, and secondly, because it arises in a removal window period, it's the same problem as the asylum protection, which is that if you don't know that your removal directions have been set, you're disabled or handicapped, I should say, in seeking the protection of the court for casework loans. But I should highlight that the, the human rights suspension issue, you can see this from the statement of Hannah Honeyman at SB1 642 to 656, 656 was not clear, clarified and was being inconsistently applied across the immigration state until after the judgment in medical justice below. Now, turning now to Articles 3 and 8, my Lord, the Equality and Human Rights Commission has put in extensive submissions on this issue, which we have adopt and accord and accept and would ask this court to rely on. And I just want to highlight a few short points before I, before I stop. Uh, the first is that the protection of Article 3 and the obligation not to return it, to return individuals to a country where there is a real risk of breach of, of the rights under Article 3 is an absolute protection. And you can see that from the case of Sardi in Italy, which is in the core bundle, tab 31, pages 760 to 761 at paragraphs 138 to 140. So if this court were to accept that there was any balance to be struck between access to justice and public interest, that would not apply in relation to Article 3. And the the um, Equality and Human Rights Commission, paragraph 21, has cited to Sousa Ribeiro in France, which is in core authorities tab 32, at paragraph 78 and 80, for the proposition that the effective remedy which is required by the European Convention must, both in article, relation to Article 3 and in relation to Article 8, must be accessible and effective in practice, not simply theoretical. That's emphasised at paragraphs 21 and 41 of the Equality and Human Rights Commission submissions. Now, in their skeleton argument, the Secretary of State has suggested that the fact that Article 13 is not one of the convention rights listed in the Human Rights Act means that it's not incorporated and not relevant. But uh, that is not correct. The purpose, the very purpose, as I, I'm sure my lords are well aware, um, this is a point that's been made on multiple uh, occasions by various courts, of the Human Rights Act, Brown and Stock was one of the first to make that point, is to ensure an effective remedy in all cases where there has been or is an arguable breach of one of the rights in the Convention. My Lord, you were taken to, to Conquer in Belgium yesterday. 
I would just like to turn that up. <coughs> That's Paul got bundle 30. Paragraph 74. Could I just highlight that one of the arguments made by the Belgian government was that there was extensive abuse of the system. Major abuses of the process in the middle of that paragraph. The vast majority of the applications were done in this room. And the Abolition of the suspensive rule, of this that issue, automatic suspensive rule, would have a, an unanticipated and disastrous effect in the Belgian context, contrary to the principle of proper administration of justice. But the court did not accept that argument as an acceptable basis for uh, depriving individuals of the right to an effective remedy. See that at 75 to 76. Now, the right to an effective remedy you can see at paragraph 76 requires only that the complaint be arguable. Now, that's important in the context of fresh claims because. As soon as a fresh claim is established as arguable, or as an arguable breach of Article 3, it gives rise to the need for an automatic suspensive remedy. And you can see that there at um, 75 to 76 and 80 to 85. Before I leave this argument, um, could I highlight in D'Souza the bearing core authorities 32 Then 83, how that works in the context of Article 8 claims. Um, which is that you still have to have access to the possibility of a, of, of a suspensive remedy, even though it doesn't have to be automatically. The appellate's argument on this ground is if you accept the Secretary of State's defence in relation to uh, the response to this appeal in relation to the common law, um, nonetheless, what is happening in practice is that individuals are being deprived of the right 
and to ask the court for a suspension of their removal. So this again is because a, a decision is, is taken and removal can happen very quickly thereafter. Yes, exactly. So because, and therefore they are simply unable to, to request the automatic suspensive effect in relation to their Article 3 claim or in relation to their Article 8 claim. Yes. But in relation to Article 3, it's obviously particularly serious um, before they've been removed. In circumstances where if they did have access to the court, they'd be able to show they had an arguable case. And so for that reason, this policy is in breach of Article 3, as well as um, double infamy. My Lords, I haven't um, taken you through, uh, through my skeleton argument, but I obviously rely on, I haven't uh, abandoned the points that were taken there, but I've sought to, not as quickly as I'd hoped, apologies, um, charter a course through the most important issues and evidence, but I rely on the arguments in the skeleton argument. Oh, I wanted to just be on note, um, highlight where the red forms were. I said I was going to show you them yesterday, oh, yes. and I didn't. They're in the bundle, core bundle one, tab nine, 241A to W. 241A to W, thank you, that was kind of just something I wanted to clarify. Oh, and there was one other point for your notice. Like I showed you guidance yesterday on the circumstances in which the timing of the service of removal notice windows in the context of charter flights. And I said that there was a similar equivalent guidance for scheduled flights. And that is, for, again, for your notice, it's SB1. Tab 42, 815-819. And it essentially echoes the same points about deciding when to serve the window, withholding details from representatives and so on. Thank you very much indeed, Ms. Kilroy. Yes, Mr. Kovats. What I propose to do is use my skeleton as the working note for my oral submissions. Um, I'll take you to such of the matters referred to in it that I think might be helpful. And I'll also, in the course of doing that, um, pick up the points that remain orally by, by the appellant this morning and yesterday. The skeleton is in the uh, medical justice core bundle. Um, tab 4, if you haven't taken that the skeleton down for already. The starting point is section 10 of the Immigration and Asylum Act uh, 1999, which we're all familiar with, but because it is central, if you um, wouldn't mind um, turning it up again. Um, Tab 3 in Volume 1 of the Authority Bundle. Uh, subsection 1. Uh, that person may be removed from the United Kingdom under the authority of the Secretary of State or Immigration Officer if the person requires leave to enter or remain in the United Kingdom. Um, but does not uh, have it. A number of points to note about that. Um, firstly, in my submission, the wording is plain and clear and no ambiguity in the wording is being put forward by the appellant. Uh, secondly, it conspicuously does not say anything, I, 
either explicitly or by implication about serving removal directions on the person in question. Uh, and thirdly, it makes it quite clear that it applies to persons who have no basis for remaining in the United Kingdom any longer at all. It doesn't mean that you are entitled to sit here and wait until some future time when the Secretary of State makes a future decision. It means that you no longer have any basis and you must depart now. Subject, of course, to raising any further representations. So it's important to get the starting point right in my submission. And we'll come back to this point again when we look at the policy. The starting point is Section 10 notices are served on persons who should depart from this country now because they have no outstanding applications or appeals and have no leave and therefore no basis for remaining, indeed, by remaining um, subject to putting in any further applications, they're committing a criminal offence. So a Section 10 notice is clear, depart now, subject to raising any further matters. The final point to note on Section 10, and just to avoid any uh, ambiguity, um, neither the Upper Tribunal nor Mr Justice Friedman, Friedman um, base their reasoning on Section 10 being construed as authorising restriction on access to the court. It's not my argument, and you've seen that it wasn't my argument before the Upper Tribunal. Um, you won't find anything to that effect in my skeleton. It's simply not our case. So we can put that, I hope, to one side. On, on Section 10, could you just help me with this? And, and it may be that you can't, and somebody will have to look it up. But in um, the uh, judgment of Miss Justice Friedman, um, he sets out Section 10, and then he sets out um, explanatory notes, and then also something from the... I think two sections from the Home Office Policy Equality Statement. It's in paragraphs 27 and 28. And, and that was that, it's not absolutely clear to me that that uh, statement was made in respect of Section 10. I assume it was because there are um, references to um, a proposal to change the primary legislation so there'll be only be one decision, which is Section 10. Um, but if somebody could check that, um, be, because if, if that's right, on, in, sec, in paragraph 28, there's a, an extract from that document, which says that the single decision will also advise the migrant that they must tell us immediately of any reasons why they should not be removed, for example, on the grounds of an asylum or human rights claim. So that suggests... Um, that Section 10 was part of a, um, a, a, a batch of mainly statutory, there are some in the rules, but mainly statutory provisions uh, seeking to um, uh, encourage, isn't the right word, draw out any claims that an individual who doesn't have the right to be in the United Kingdom claims that they are entitled to that right, draw out those claims. So is Section 10 part of the, the, the batch of provisions which includes um, Section 120 and Section 96? That was a, a terribly long question. Well, Section 10 was one of the many amendments which made fundamental changes to uh, the immigration system that were introduced by the 2014 Act. So in that very high-level sense... The answer is, is manifestly yes. Uh, and you will be able to see from checking the footnotes to the various extracts set out in these parts of the authorities bundles that a lot of the current versions were introduced by the 2014 Act. So ra rather than take up time, I, I will get back, back to that. But to, to, to answer your question in part, it's apparent from the footnotes that yes, it was part of a, an overall reform. To, 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 to get to get individuals who to, to get individuals to regularise their immigration status if they do if they did not have leave. 
Can I say that that's a, that's a safe inference to, to draw? Um, I'll, I'll check the point about the policy statements to see whether it was spelt out in black or white. But yes, they're, they're, I don't think there's any real doubt that the underlying purpose was um, uh, that. And I'll come back to the policy policy statement um, in a few minutes, perhaps before lunch, perhaps afterwards. changes made in the next few paragraphs of the skeleton, but if I can now go on to um, section 7 and note um, as part of the overall statutory scheme, following on from the radical change in the rights of appeal, um, it's important to note some of the safeguard provisions, and these are now to be found in the 2002 Act. This is paragraph 7 of the skeleton. Um, we needn't turn these up now. But you see section 78, se section 77, statutory bar on removal while the appeal's pending. Section 78, statutory bar on removal. Um, Sorry, during claims and during appeals. So section 78, 77 and 78 together. No removal until your asylum claim has been determined by the Secretary of State and any appeals being determined. And then we have further provisions in sections 92 to 96 about certifications and in-country appeals and out-of-country appeals. And then again, another measure, this is paragraph 8 of the skeleton, again brought in by the 2014 Act, the section 120 notice. And can ask you to turn this up, please. This is volume one of the authorities, tab five. At page 67. examples in medical justice supplementary bundle 2 at tab 47 page 994 
details of the individual concern have been blanked out, but you can see it's an actual case. Example, you needn't turn this up, but just for the reference of page 1807. Well, it's easy. If you say you've got to do it, um, read as soon as reasonably practicable or whatever the, the, the language yes. is. Um, but that, of course, is all subject to the caveat on page 994 that you'll be removed, possibly, um, on the 15th of June. 1500, this notice having been provided at some time on the, on the 12th. Yes, yes, and of course, we'll so get on to that in, in, yeah. in more detail later. But uh, I'll, I'll say it now because I'm going to be coming back to this uh, repeatedly, I suspect. Um, if instead of a Section 10 notice with removal and notice periods, you simply had the removal directions, because uh, as I've sought to establish, you only get the section 10 when you've got no basis for being. So you could be given the removal notice at, at that same date. Say you've been given the removal directions for three days later, you would be told, well, three days later you are going to be removed. And we would have the same arguments that we're going to have to address in this appeal about whether or not that is too short a period, etc., etc., and we'll come on to look at all those and the exceptions later on. But you, you're no worse off by being told that the three days is not a deadline, it's a minimum. In terms of being told what you're at risk of and what you have to do if you wish to to prevent it, you're told exactly the same thing. Um, I'll turn up briefly because it's referred to in BA Nigeria, which is one of the authorities relied on. I want to say a bit more about that later. Um, section 96, volume 1 of the authorities, tab 5 at page 63. on the facts 
I may have a bit more to say later, but effectively I'm going to say I commend the judgments of the Amber Tribunal and of Mr Justice Friedman. So certainly the, the great majority of my submissions are going to be dealing with the law and setting out what the relevant documents are, which is why I'm asking your indulgence to bear with me while I'm going through it fairly slowly now. So tab 5, page 63, section 96. And the point to make here is this says nothing one way or the other about judicial review. What it does is it certifies that you have no right of appeal if you could have made a point earlier but you failed um, to do so. So that deals with one aspect of late claims, which is the appeals, but it, it simply doesn't address judicial review, which is what we're concerned with here. I'm now going on to the next section of the skeleton, the policy headed just above paragraph 12. And can I start by way of um, preliminary observation um, by taking you back to FB Supplementary Bundle 1 at page A32, which is the policy equality statement. date on this at um, page 836, September 2015. Sorry, what's the date again? It's 14 September 2015. 50. Thank you. And I'm taking you to this to show what the Home Office said was the purpose of this. And the point I'm seeking to make is it's not simply a question of, of, of abuse. Um, the appellants have sought to characterise this policy as, a, as an unconstitutional sledgehammer to, to crack an abusive nut, but that, with all due respect, doesn't do justice to the full reasons why this policy was introduced, which is why I'm starting off in this preliminary observation with the policy equality statement. And we see right at the start the purpose was to simplify a complex system. And then third paragraph down, as a consequence, practice, and I don't think this is contentious, but for the avoidance of doubt, my, my position is previously it was a practice rather than a legal requirement, but I don't think anything's going to turn on that. The practice of serving copies of removal directions which allows claims to be withheld would be discontinued. And then, new policy, you either get a removal window, notice of removal directions, or notice of removal. And then, next paragraph, we can skip that. That's certain exclusions, families, children, vulnerable groups that are not suitable for detention. And then the further paragraph, notice of removal may be given where a person has no leave, will not be given where there's excellent leave, or an appeal or administrative review is, is pending. Now, you haven't been troubled with administrative review. Um, we'll see later that one of the pre-notice checks, in other words, checks that caseworkers have to do before they consider sending a Section 10 notice, is to check that there are no outstanding casework things to do. And administrative review is one of those outstanding things. So although FB is a protection case, and most of the submissions we've been hearing about are protection cases, this policy applies to the full range of cases. And there is a long, complicated list of decisions that are subject to administrative review and are not. And oversimplifying protection claims are not, because you get the right of appeal if you get anything, because it's a protection claim. But a lot of other claims are. And for example, in practice, probably the most important one is people under the points-based system. So if you're a student or a worker and your claim's rejected, you've got no right of appeal anymore, but you do have a right of administrative review. And the time scale for that is, is seven days if you're in detention. Most of these people are not in detention, so 14 days. So that already means that there's a substantial, significant period of time after your refusal decision because you've got the opportunity for applying for administrative review. And you can't even get a Section 10 notice until that period's expired. And either you haven't made the application or you haven't, it's been determined. So just to note that. And then 
The next paragraph down this is towards the bottom of page A32, the objectives. First bullet point, simplify. Simplify operational processes and procedures to improve the efficiency of the removal process. Second one, create a removals process which effectively balances the need to enforce immigration laws with the needs to ensure that human rights issues are raised and properly considered. Now, the appellants attack um, this very notion of, of a balance. Um, and I'm going to come into more detail with this later, but because I'm, I'm sort of setting out the stall at this stage, uh, let, me, let me deal with balance um, by way of introduction in this way. My case is that in terms of access to justice, I'm not talking about a balance. As the Lord Chief Justice uh, observed yesterday, um, uh, this case uh, is perhaps really, and I would say, if anything, a rationality challenge. And if that is one way of looking at at least an important aspect of it, then questions of balance do arise, because to put it bluntly, but I do submit accurately, what the appellant submissions come down to is that if I am a migrant, however many refusals I get, whenever I say something more, and it may be something I haven't said before, it may be something I have said before, um, but one way or another I've said something again. Whatever has been taken, and this would apply if I had been served with removal direction, so it's not a point that's specific to the policy. Um, everything has to stop. All bets are off. Secretary of State has to look at my further representations. She has to make a decision on them. She may accept them. I may have a right of appeal. I may even get leave. Or she may reject them. She may reject them and I do get a right of appeal. She may reject them and I don't get a right of appeal. But the Secretary of State's got to make a decision. And the Secretary of State, having made a decision, I have then got to get time to get a lawyer and then have time to get before a judge. And the judge has got to make a decision. And the Secretary of State is never, ever allowed to remove me until all that's gone through. And I can keep doing that indefinitely. And th that is what the appellant's case comes down to. I've got a veto on my removal. Because I can keep on making further representations. I, they can be repetitive. As Lord Justice Hickenbottom pointed out, if I serve 250 pages, you've still got to read all of them to work out whether it includes anything new or not. And that process can't be short-circuited. So this is the target I am aiming at, so to speak. Because the logic of the appellant's argument is that migrants have a veto on their removal. Now, if their access to justice point is a good one, well, so be it. But if we put access to justice for one side for the moment, and we look at it in terms of a rationality challenge, then that is one side of the balance. And I said I'll come on to these in more detail later, but I'm just, just setting out. So, so those were the first two bullet points in the objectives of the policy and quality statement. Um, and then it goes on over the top of page 33. By implementing the policy and operational changes, we aim to achieve the following outcomes. More efficient casework and operational enforcement. Higher volumes of voluntary departures. And that's an aspect that should not be overlooked either. Because as we'll see from the notice you get, it will say, look, you don't have any leave. You've got no outstanding applications. You're no longer lawfully in the United Kingdom. So you must leave or make a further application using the Section 120 procedure. Um, so encouraging voluntary applications is a legitimate and important aspect of this policy. Then reduced appeals and litigation costs. And again, this is viewed from the other end of the telescope by the appellant who go on about bringing forward the notice. In fact... What he's done is instead of giving you removal directions and then letting you judicially review them, you say, I'm going to give you a notice. So you've got at least three days and then you've got a removal window. And that is giving you as much time as in the real world is possible to get your submissions together. So 
Next bullet point, full consideration of any human rights issues at the outset of the process. Now, the appellants seem to find it objectionable that they're expected to take the initiative, so to speak, and make their further applications, if any, as soon as they're told they've got no legal and are liable to removal. But for reasons that are not articulated, and in my submission would not withstand scrutiny, the idea that you can wait until you've actually got a set of removal directions in your hand before you're under any obligation to put in your further applications is one that has no support in statute, in legal principle, or in morals, in my respectful submission. Now, we're not a court of morals, of course. So, again, that's a legitimate aspect of the policy I do submit. Full consideration of any human rights claims at the outset of the process. And then next, reduction in number of costs of failed removals. Um, in the real world, that's legitimate consideration. And, and reduced time spent in detention before removal. So it's not a policy that is narrowly focused on the small hammied jurisdiction range of abuse cases. It's more subtle and more broad range than that. So shall, sure. we, shall we leave it there until 2 o'clock? Yes. Yeah.